thanks everyone for joining. You have our full and undivided attention for the next hour as far as the agenda of what we're going to cover today. Probably the first 30 minutes, Keith and Greg are going to go over um, industry-related topics regarding multi-carrier supply chain solutions. Um, Keith Myers is one of our head consultants over here at Shipware. Um, I'm part of the Channel Alliance team. I've been with Shipware for about five years and really work to manage some of our strategic partners. Um, and that's the, the reason that we partnered up with Creative Logistics Solutions, um, because they're a seamless partner of ours um, in the technology space. So um, Greg Marone, he's one of their uh, directors over at Creative Logistics and has basically spent over 20 years um, in different direct-to-consumer technology supply chain roles um, and now is focused specifically on um, the transportation management system solutions specific to warehouse optimization and really multi-carrier um, supply chain. And then Keith Myers, he came from FedEx, spent over seven years over there in their revenue management team and has since for the last four years worked on Shipware's um, consulting side, our professional services group. And he works with shippers of all shapes and sizes um, on really consultative basis, carrier rate renegotiation, and overall just optimization. So we have really two industry experts. They're going to be talking about what they see in the field right now when they're working with their clients um, and also from their experience in the past. Really, we have three main topics, the state of the market today and the impact that it has on both the carriers, so primarily FedEx, UPS, the post office, um, and the major LTL providers, what that state of the market does to the shipper. So you all that have joined us today and what we see as response tactics to stay nimble in the, in the modern kind of landscape. And then really some tips, some best practices, some common pitfalls around the process of both implementation of a multi-carrier solution and then um, really how to get that process rolling and, and, and what you need to have a successful um, implementation. So I'll let Keith and Greg maybe do a quick introduction to themselves about uh, you know their role, and then we'll go right into the the topics. Sounds good. Uh, so, I'm, as uh, Connor mentioned, I'm Greg Brown with uh, Creative Logistics Solutions. Um, do have about uh, spent about the last twenty years on logistics, uh, mainly from the IT and operations side. Uh, so it's been kind of a blessing to be able to see it, you know, from the operational side as well as the IT side. Um, and now that I'm with Creative Logistics, you know, I get to go into to warehouses and, and really see, you know, the, the issues and the challenges that, that people have and you know, can help them uh, to find the best ways to solve it. So uh, it's it, when I first got into it, I, I wasn't sure what I was getting into, but uh, it's been it's been a great career for the last 20 years. And now I think the visibility in logistics is so much more than has been, you know, in the past um, that we're seeing a lot more focus on it. And I think it's, it's um, about time really. And I think it's, it's a great change. Great. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. And then I'm Keith Myers, uh, as Connor mentioned, I've been with Shipware for about four and a half years now. And prior to that spent seven years in the revenue management group at FedEx. So if any of y'all are FedEx shippers out there, those pricing agreements that you get, that was, you know, I was one of those pricing people that would put those agreements together, do the analysis, and you know, help to help to figure it out. Now I'm on the uh, now I'm on the good side, trying to, to cut into the margins that FedEx and UPS are making, helping out, uh, helping shippers improve the rates. And kind of prior to that, I've been in an, kind of logistics analytics roles for you know, probably you know, almost 20 years as well in this in this space. So I've got a pretty good pretty good sense of what's going on. I'm uh, looking forward to talking with y'all today. So as Connor mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, about the market. Uh, and really discuss what we what we're seeing companies do and help explain kind of how to engage, how to start this process of looking at other carriers. Uh, and just to re reiterate what Connor said earlier, uh, any questions that you have that come up, direct them towards him. He's kind of he's the facilitator for this, and so he'll pipe in with questions as uh, where appropriate, or we will and or we will cover them uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of our content. All right, as far as what's going on in the marketplace. So you know, we're still seeing capacity limits from UPS, from FedEx. It's gonna happen again during peak. So, um, you know, if, I don't, depending on what size shipper you all, you may have experienced it 
or you may not have, but particularly for larger shippers uh, in peak time, we have plenty of instances where FedEx and UPS have come to them and said, yeah, typically we're giving you five trailers, but we're only gonna be able to give you two for you know October, November, December, or, you know, or, or things along those lines, which throws a completely new set of challenges to you know, executing shipments when all of a sudden you've lost you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% of your expected capacity to, uh, to, to move those shipments. So it leaves you scrambling to find some other options, which kind of leads to some of the conversations that we're having here. Uh, and then you know, packages left at the dock. Greg, I think you said you've got a, uh, yeah. an anecdote on this. Yeah, we, we, had a, we were working with a major retailer that uh, did a lot of e-commerce as well. And they went through, you know, and it was 2019 actually. So they actually were jumping the gun a little bit, but they went through some of the capacity limits then and ended up um, being able, they had a primary shipper that they were using. And that was their only relationship with the national. And they let them know about a week before that they were only going to get limited uh, trucks. And then even then they were supposed to get, you know, 10 to 12 a day, they would, they would sometimes only send nine or eight. And they ended up with packages just sitting on the dock. And, you know, the problem obviously during peak, anytime you don't want packages left sitting on the dock, but every day, you know, those packages kept rolling over and rolling over and they couldn't get them shipped out. They had no other alternative. So, you know, I think prior to that, you know, it was, you know, just working with the carrier to figure out, you know, the best way to handle it. But it reached the point, you know, especially in 2020, where the carriers just did not have uh, the capacity to be able to do it. And so you know, I think, you know, they weren't the only ones that, that had that challenge that year, I'm sure. Great. Yeah, good, uh, good example. Uh, and then carrier rate increases. So, you know, they happen every year, like clockwork. Uh, the rate increase for 2022 was the highest ever. Uh, it was an average increase of 5.9%. Uh, if, you know, depending on how long you've been paying attention to the market, you know, in you know, the early 2000s, that average was about the same, 5.9 or 6.9 sometimes, but it was offset by reductions to the fuel surcharge table. Uh, but there were no reductions to fuel this year. Uh, in fact, it was the opposite. Fuel was increased multiple times over the, over the last year, uh, which compounded the effect of that, of that rate increase. So, and we'll, you know, based on last year, last couple of years, uh, I expect FedEx to announce their 2023 rates sometime in the middle of September. So we'll, uh, we will see what that looks like, but I am assuming another 5.9% increase on the, uh, on the net transportation rates. And then that, that 5.9 has nothing to do with surcharges. So they're, they're increased by a separate amount. Average increase for last year was almost 10% and the key surcharges. So again, we'll, We'll wait and see. Uh, and then there's these never ending demand surcharges. UPS rebranded it, rebranded them as demand surcharges uh, as part of their 2022 rate changes. Uh, and those are still in effect. You know, if, you, if you're a high volume shipper, uh, you're getting, getting dinged for a residential, uh, you know, an extra residential fee. Uh, if you're not a high volume shipper, but you ship additional handling or oversized packages, uh, UPS is charging you a fee. They've been doing that all year. FedEx did not do that. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, coming up uh, on, in a, on the next slide, but it's just not anything that's going away or these peak and demand related surcharges that were instituted during COVID and have been in place uh, ever since. And depending on what's going on in the, or how closely you're paying attention to the market, there are a lot of frustrations with the FedEx ground contractors. So the, the FedEx model for their home delivery, their commercial ground, business is those are not employees, they're contractors. Uh, and as you can imagine, with you know, the, the increases in fuel, fuel search, fuel costs over the, last few, uh, over the last few months, a lot of those increases, although FedEx and UPS as well, increased their fuel surcharge percentages and whatnot, a lot of the additional revenue was not passed along to those ground contractors that are the ones that are actually affected by it. So there is, you know, FedEx is reporting solid margins, but a lot of their ground contractors are struggling. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a groundswell of a, a little of, of an attempt to organize the contractors. Now there's, there's some likely legal challenges there with you know, FedEx basically saying, we're not going to do that. You know, that's a breach of your agreement as a, 
as a contractor if you start to uh, to try to collectively bargain. But it is something to watch. There's a little bit more momentum on that than there has been uh, in the past years. Uh, in fact, there's a, a big conference for all of these contractors coming up at the end of this month out in Las Vegas. And I saw a blurb that said they're uh, it's going to be the highest attended conference that they've ever had uh, as, as people are starting to try to figure out what to do as a, as a ground contractor to, you know, I guess, you know, make money. Uh, they've, they've really taken a, a bath over the past, over the past few months during COVID. So another thing to keep track of. And then we've got this focus on quality, not quantity. So I got two quotes here, one from uh, Carol Tomei, CEO of UPS, one from Brie Carrere, the Chief Marketing Officer at FedEx. You can see both of them talk about revenue quality. So UPS has this better, not bigger strategy, um, you know, and, and FedEx has a targeted growth strategy. So, but the focus is revenue quality. Uh, it's not necessarily volume. Uh, they're going to be more particular about what packages they want. And let's talk a little bit about what that is you know, and how that revenue quality is coming into play. Well, part of it is forced rate increases. Uh, if, you, if you look back on some of the transcripts over the last few quarterly, uh, quarterly earnings calls from, um, from both UPS and FedEx, they do reference that they've had uh, conversations with their larger shippers that have gone very well. Uh, I, I think Carol Tomei phrased it something along those lines in one of the earnings calls a couple of quarters ago that generally, basically are them UPS and FedEx going to their largest customers that aren't necessarily profitable and saying, look, you're gonna to have to take this increase or we're not going to pick up or you know, even fire you as a, in some instances, they've just gone in and straight fired customers because the margins have been so, uh, have been so out of line. So you know, they're, both carriers are being more aggressive with that. You know, <clears throat> Peak surcharges we've talked about, uh, talked about a little bit uh, that UPS renamed their demand surcharges and they've been in place all year. Uh, FedEx just announced their peak surcharges for Q4 uh, last week. Um, they, uh, they will go into effect the beginning of October. Uh, they are adding a, uh, a peak surcharge for the month of September that's less on additional handling and oversized. That is one area of difference um, with where FedEx did not extend those additional handling and peak surcharges throughout the year like UPS did. But uh, it, it does start up uh, right at the beginning of Q4. <clears throat> Volume caps we talked about, you know, there have been uh, both FedEx and UPS have come, gone to their largest customers and said, look, we can't pick up this much anymore. It's overflow, it's flooding our network. We aren't able to handle it. Fuel. So um, the fuel is uh, a little bit of a shell game. Um, you know, obviously, you know, FedEx and UPS, they're you know, public companies, they have shareholder expectations. And so you know, a lot of their decisions are driven towards, you know, hitting those goals and showing that growth that everybody wants. And, and fuel is one of the areas where they've uh, been able to do that. You know, as the price of fuel has absolutely gone up, there's no question about that. But the changes that FedEx and UPS have made to their tables have really um, are inconsistent with the increase that uh, that fuel took and allowed them to to make some some significant uh, margin improvements. So and you know it, it, they pretty much go in lock lockstep. So in April uh, April fourth, FedEx changed their fuel surge fuel surcharge table, uh, and on April eleventh, UPS did the same thing. So you know it's just you know, something to watch. Uh, then on top of all of that, you know, the money back guarantees. So it used to be you sent a ground package and it got there a day late, you get a refund on it. But uh, once COVID started, those money back guarantees went out the window. They have not been reinstated for a ground shipment or any sort of deferred air product. Now for overnight, yes, those have been reinstated for about a year. Uh, and, and so the, the carriers have been granting refunds, but there's certainly a push um, on both sides from both carriers to uh, any sort of new pricing to not offer that money back guarantee out of the gate. <clears throat> yeah. And rate increases we talked about, uh, we don't need to revisit that. Uh, and then minimum commitment, commitment thresholds and early termination penalties. So we're seeing more of that, um, you know, more of that from the carriers trying to say, look, we expect this much volume. 
And if you fall below that, then we reserve the right to penalize you. Or you know, we want you, you know, we want this business to be in place for three years, four years, you know, whatever. If you try to negotiate or try to leave, then we're going to penalize you. So you know, it's a, a lot of stuff to, you know, that's that's built in to try to keep those those revenue numbers up and keep that revenue quality. Uh, it's not necessarily a, you know, it's not necessarily a race to you know, the lowest rates. Um, they're both FedEx and UPS are being very, uh, very diligent about trying to hold the hold the line on margins. Now it remains to be seen as we're you know there's lots of talks of recession and and whatnot. You know, what the how the market is going to soften and and how this may change in the coming quarters. But right now this is this is what we're seeing. All right, and Greg's going to talk a little bit about what companies are doing in response. Excellent. Go ahead and bring up the first one. There we go. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, what we talked about and and what Keith had kind of outlined that the carriers are doing. So, you know, with the capacity limits and the rates and everything that's going on, you know, being a single vendor shipper now is very difficult. You know, like when the old days you used to have a UPS house or a FedEx house, and you know, but basically 100 percent of the shipments went through that one carrier. Now that's very difficult, um, you know, and again, starting in 2019, 2020, the shippers were beginning to see that. And, and, and most of our clients were beginning to see that as well. And most of our clients already had multiple carriers. But what we saw and, and what a response to this is, was adding more regional carriers to, to their shipping options. And what that allows you to do is, you know, offload some of that volume that maybe went to UPS or a FedEx uh, or a DHL and use a, a smaller regional carrier or even like, you know, a laser ship, or if you're in the West, there's on track, you know, the different regions. Um, and that allows you to offset that volume, send some of the volume to regional carriers that, that alleviates that. Um, so you don't need the same capacity that you needed from your national carrier before. Okay, go ahead to the next one, Keith. Um, so another way to, to reduce some of the capacity for your primary carriers, we saw a lot of our clients looking at changing the LTL weight threshold. So what that means is if you ship both LTL and parcel, um, you know, normally you would have certain weight thresholds, say 200 pounds. So if the shipment going to the client was over 200 pounds total weight, it probably went LTL versus parcel uh, because it was less expensive to send it LTL versus parcel. Um, so what some of the response to in order to alleviate that parcel capacity, they would lower the LTL weight threshold. So now maybe if the shipment's 150 pounds total weight, it's going to go to an LTL versus going, or sorry, yeah, it'll go to an LTL versus parcel where it would have before. So you may end up paying a little bit more, but the advantage is you're freeing up that space on the parcel trucks now. So you're sending basically more LTL, less parcel. Um, so we saw a lot of folks do that in, in response to the capacity limits as well. Go ahead to the next point. Uh, so rate shopping, um, it, it's been big for a long time, but it, it got really big over the last few years. Um, so obviously rate shopping at a high level is rate shopping between multiple carriers. So it could be national carriers like UPS and FedEx. Maybe you have you know contracts with both, discounted rates with both. You want to rate shop between the two. Um, also, that includes regional carriers. Um, throw a laser ship in the mix, or for different regions, um, we could add in, you know, an OnTrack or a Speedy, depending on what the region is that you're in. And so, rate shopping allows you, at a high level, to select the cheapest carrier. But it also, because it became so prevalent, um, a lot of functionality actually has been added around rate shopping. So, the higher end multi-carrier systems, they'll be able to do other things like. Um, we can look at um, complex rules. So for example, you know, let's say maybe, you know, you need to be careful and not redirect all of your shipping volume. Um, you don't want to, like uh, uh, Keith had mentioned in the previous slide, there's minimums that the carriers still want, right? So you don't want to suddenly take all those shipments from FedEx and redirect them to another carrier because the other carrier may be cheaper. Suddenly you're going to fall below the minimum for FedEx and that, that could threaten your, your contract with them. Um, as well, a lot of carriers have volume discounts, right? So you have a certain amount of volume that you need to ship per month to get that volume discount. So you don't want to pull away too much uh, to affect that volume discount. So rate shopping has become a lot more complex and complicated in being able to address all of those rules as well. 
Um, so most of the multi-carrier systems can do that uh, today. And what we see is not just true rate shopping, but very much a, a specific rate shopping with um, these extra rules in mind. Um, also being able to wait and add fudge factors to different carriers. For example, um, we know that UPS Silver is you know, great in this area, but maybe not so great in the South. Maybe it's an extra day going through Atlanta or something like that. You can actually take all that into consideration now in, in the complex systems. And we're seeing a lot of companies do that today. Hey, Greg, we had a question come in around the rate shopping sure. capabilities or possibilities when you mentioned the LTL versus parcel. Is that something that's that's able to be accomplished with some of these systems? Um, you know, how does that happen or, or get done so that they're picking which really mode to use properly? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, Connor. Um, so the way that it can work is systems can, depending on the system, of course, um, you can rate shop LTL versus parcel. Um, and, you know, again, that's a customization where you would want, um, you know, certain cutoffs and you'd have to have, you know, the, the rates loaded in the system for the LTL. Uh, but we do have a, a few clients that actually do do that. And, um, you know, and then you can, again, it can still consider all those other rules. You know, maybe we have capacity for parcel today. It's a little bit cheaper. Let's go that way. We don't have it today. Let's adjust uh, the LTL rate shop so that it selects the LTLs more because we're going to have more room on the parcel trucks. Um, so that's a great question. So, yeah, you, you can rate shop uh, LTL versus parcel in most circumstances. And then actually a follow-up question for Keith. I know we've come across some of our clients that have bundled LTL parcel-based revenue bands. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's certain, you know, benefits there where you could also leverage some volume from the LTL mode that still would be contributing to those earned discount tiers for FedEx or UPS if you're using their freight product. Would that be able to kind of lump, lump together? Yeah, so you know, it definitely applies to to FedEx. That's their standard uh, their standard setup on their agreements is to include all revenue, so parcel and LTL, and those earned discount calculations, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later on. Uh, UPS did sell off their LTL division, uh, so that concept is going away on the UPS side. So they don't have the LTL uh, revenue directly uh, directly involved. I think there's a little bit of a uh, almost a grace period of sorts as they wind that part of their business down. But it, uh, it's one of the rare areas where UPS and FedEx have uh, have departed on strategy is how they handle LTL. Excellent. Um, so yeah, so zone skipping um, is another uh, process that companies are doing. And a lot of this is reduced freight as well as capacity. So Zone skipping, I'll just do a quick description of what it is because I know everybody has kind of different names for it. Uh, but what a zone skip is, um, so let's say you have a warehouse in California and um, you realize that a majority of your product is going, let's say, to the, the Northeast. Uh, so what you could do is basically, instead of using FedEx as your primary, um, you could ship your packages from your warehouse in California, but the labels that were being labeled on, the FedEx labels, uh, their origin is the, the FedEx hub that's in, let's say, New Jersey as an example. And so then what you do is you ship all these packages that are going into the Northeast with those labels with that origin of the New Jersey FedEx hub. And then you put them on a truck from your LA distribution center and you would truck them all the way to New Jersey and induct them into the New Jersey hub, the FedEx hub there, and then FedEx would deliver from there. Um, there's a lot of different advantages to this. Um, and it, depending on your volumes, uh, you can have multiple zone skips to multiple areas of the country. Uh, but one of the, the biggest advantages is freight cost, right? So if you're shipping from LA to the Northeast, you're probably going zone seven or zone eight, which is very expensive. While if you're inducting it into the New Jersey hub, the origin is New Jersey. So most of that is going, you know, lower zones, one, two, three, depending on, you know, where, where it's shipping to in that area. Um, so that actual freight cost is much less, even when you add in that that first leg, that LTL leg, um, the freight is still going to be cheaper per box because you get to divide the freight cost of that first leg between all the packages that are on that truck. Um, and in some instances, depending on where you're skipping to and what carriers you're using, you can also shave off transit time. 
uh, because you're getting it out to their hubs faster. So they don't have to induct it into, say, the FedEx hub in LA, do the sortation, you know, get it out to, to the, you know, put it on trucks and get it back east. You're handling that first leg yourself. Um, so, you know, and and the zone skip, um, like I said, that reduces freight as well as transit time, as well it reduces capacity because these packages normally would have been loaded on the FedEx truck in your LA warehouse, but instead you're putting them on an LTL truck that's shaking them directly to Jersey for induction. Um, so we've seen zone skipping um, really become predominant for, for companies that, that have that profile that's able to do it. And then when I say it can be done by carrier or by the company, um, so the only difference there would be FedEx and UPS um, do offer, in some cases, they'll handle that first leg shipping um, themselves. And what that allows you to do is um, basically it still get the advantage, but you don't have to pay for the LTL piece. The disadvantage is freight cost, you're still paying as if you're shipping from your origin to that zone. But the advantage there is strictly time and transit. If, if the carrier like a UPS or FedEx handles that first leg, you're shaving off time and transit. That's the main benefit. You're still paying the same uh, freight cost. So that's, that's kind of two different ways. Hey, Keith, I know we had a question come in in the Q&A. Do you want to just let the attendees know verbally? Because I think that was answered privately. Oh, it was? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question was around uh, ground with freight pricing with UPS and what the status of that was. Uh, my, uh, and the response I put in, my, uh, my understanding of the, the, the deal that UPS signed with T-Force was that that ground with freight pricing was going to stay in place for a couple of years. I think it's three or four. I don't remember the exact amount, but ultimately it will be going away. Uh, but it is, there is a, a little bit of time before uh, before that happens. Now, I do not think you can get, uh, I don't know if you can get ground with freight pricing today if you don't already have it, um, but in terms of, but ultimately it will be going away, but it's not uh, in the immediate future. Good question. Uh, consolidating shipments uh, touches a little bit on zone skipping as well. So consolidating shipments basically would be able to consolidate and then truck to certain areas for a zone skip. The other piece would be being able to consolidate um, for pre-sorting for the postal service. So as an example, um, DHL e-commerce, um, you know, they'll pick up and then it goes into inducted into their hub in Los Angeles, to say as an example, and then it gets routed to the, the major bulk mail centers. What you can do instead is you can actually pre-sort it at your warehouse. Um, so you could have um, an LA consolidation, um, a, a Dallas consolidation, New Jersey consolidation, et cetera, pre-sort it at your warehouse. So then when DHL picks it up, they'll take the, the Dallas and the Jersey consolidations and won't even go into the LA distribution center. They'll just throw it right on a plane and it goes out to that, that distribution center there for them. Um, and the advantage there is, um, again, it sometimes will save you transit time, but um, normally that allows you to negotiate a lower rate with that carrier as well, because you're doing part of their job basically by consolidating it up front. Um, so we've seen a lot of clients do that. Um, and then changing shipping profile, right? So, you know, as Keith mentioned, the carriers are really focused now on quality over quantity. You know, in the old days, it was if you had the big volumes, you could you could really negotiate great weights and, and you had a lot of leverage. Today, not so much. Um, so what we mean by changing your shipping profile and basically removing, quote unquote, undesirable shipments, you know, FedEx and UPS, they really don't want to deliver the, the small light stuff, um, you know, to to the consumers. That's that's not their that's not where they make their best margin, frankly. So a lot of times what you can do is by adding maybe USPS that you didn't ship before, that takes away those really light um, packages that are going to consumers uh, directly to the homes, residential shipments, which the big carriers don't want anyway. You're getting a cheaper rate through the postal service than you would be from them. And it gives you more leverage now because your quality, quote unquote, is now better to that national carrier. So that gives you more leverage on, on rate negotiation as well. Okay, so how to determine what's best. So in the previous slide, we kind of talked about, you know, some of the responses we see to what's going on. But obviously, 
that's not going to fit everybody. So, you know, how do you start to look at what's what's best for your specific uh, shipping profile for your company? Uh, so probably the single most important thing is to, to know your data, right? And what that means is basically um, know where your shipments are going. Um, so we do what's called, a, you know, hotspot. Um, it's just a map of the country that has, you know, different colors of where your major volumes are going. Um, what that allows you to do is see, is there a possibility for zone skips? Like I said, if you're, you know, shipping across the country into one area specifically, and it has, you know, 50% of your shipments, that's definitely a place you want to look at, you know, and is it a zone skip? That may be a good solution, or maybe a second warehouse opened up in that area is a better solution, right? But first you need to know that, that breakdown. Um, and the same thing with the frequency of the zone shift goes right in hand in hand with the, with, um, the hot spots. You know, how often are you going to different zones? You know, how, is there a way that you can, you can make that a shorter trip, either by a zone skip or a second warehouse or, or you know, what you, can you do? Um, no, again, in the data, how does dimensional weight impact you? Um, you know, a lot of companies, you know, in the, in the past didn't really understand dimensional weight. Obviously, I think everybody that's going to be on this call is aware of it. Basically, it is um, if you ship very light product um, instead of the actual weight of the package that you're going to get billed on, you're going to get billed on the size of that package. Uh, back in the old days, it used to be air shipments only. Uh, now it's obviously it's been ground for a long, long time now. Um, but they, that's the space that takes up on the truck and on the plane. Um, so do you have a lot of packages that, that end up going dimensional weight or dim weight or not a lot? If you do have a lot, there's, you know, what can you do about that? There's different solutions. Do we want to look at box sizes? Maybe we need to decrease our box size. You know, you don't want to ship air. It's, it's very expensive. Um, or maybe you can, and as Keith, I'm sure knows, everything is, pretty much negotiable in a contract, negotiate your dim weight factor. Um, I think the the standard factor now is 139, if I'm not mistaken, you know, right. negotiate, yeah, negotiate that to, to a higher number. Um, you know, so again, you need to know what, how this affects you and what percentage it's going to affect, but, but the knowledge is power. Oops. Oh, you're good. It gave you a sneak peek, a little foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what areas of the country are shipments going to and can you consolidate? We talked about on the last side, uh, being able to, to analyze the data. And, you know, when I say can you consolidate, some of it is, um, so let's say you're trying to get up volumes for zone skipping as an example. So maybe you look at it and you say, you know what, we'd love to zone skip to, to the Northeast, but we just don't have the volume to do it. You know, we'll only fill half a truck, you know, and that that's not going to be, that's not going to do it for us. It's going to be too expensive. Well, you know, can you hold those shipments for a day? So in other words, you don't send it every day, you send it every other day. Um, so in that case, you're able to consolidate all those shipments um, for two days going to that one area, fill the truck, and, and now you get the true zone skip. Um, analyzing the warehouse processes. This is this one's a little more complicated. So the, the first points I kind of talked about were all data that you can export um, from your WMS or your TMS um, or your multi-carrier system, you know, this is more somebody's actually going to have to go out in the warehouse, right, and look at those processes. Um, can you increase your shipping window? What does that mean? Um, you know, a lot of companies only maybe you pick for the first, you know, two or three hours, and then only after that do you have the volume then to actually start shipping. So you're kind of putting your shipping into the last three or four hours of the day. Is there a way you can ship throughout the whole day or into the evening second shift? You know, does that make sense? Um, also, you can increase your shipping window <clears throat> by speeding up your processes. Um, you, if you can ship faster and you can print labels faster, um, that, that increases the number of shipments that you can get out uh, during that window. Um, as well, you know, can you pre-consolidate, as I talked about, the postal shipments? And, and this is more, you know, logically it may make sense. And from the data, it makes sense. But when you go out to the warehouse, you look... And maybe you don't have the room to be able to do that, right? And to pre-consolidate USPS, maybe you realize, okay, we need five lanes that we need to be able to consolidate in. And maybe you don't have those that available in your warehouse, but you know, you're moving to a new building or you're you're leasing it, you're extending your lease into the second half of your existing building with that in mind, right? Okay, we're gonna need these lanes to be able to pre-consolidate postal because that's really gonna save us money in the future. Um, so that's another thing to look at uh, is the warehouse and your actual property. 
All right. And then transit times, you know, we talked about zone skipping, speeding up transit times, but, you know, will your, your clients accept a slower transit time, you know, for a while with, with Amazon out there and free two day delivery, you know, everybody had to meet that. Right. Well, I think one of the side effects of COVID is that people really aren't that hung up now on the two day free. Um, it's, it's still there, but I think a lot of clients now are accepting of, you know, a three day or four day delivery, um, you know, and if they are, and if, if that doesn't affect uh, your, your revenue, then you can save quite a bit of money by doing that. So you got to look at your, your client base and, and your product. Is this something that makes sense to have a three or four day transit time? All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about how to approach this. So, you know, anytime you want to engage with a carrier that you're not currently using, you know, be that you know, you're not uh, UPS or FedEx or one of the regional carriers, postal consolidators, whatever, data is the important thing. Uh, as, you know, as, as I said earlier, I spent seven years in the revenue management group of FedEx. Uh, the best way to get me to make an aggressive recommendation was to actually give me data to work on. Uh, Cause then that way I was confident in the numbers that I was putting forward. Uh, as opposed to relying on you know, some averages that were provided by sales. So getting that data together is important. You know, your zip codes, services you use, dimensions, the, the actual weight of the package, all that information is what uh, your non-incumbent carriers are going to need to understand who you are as a shipper. You, know, you don't have to, you know, it's, it's nothing proprietary. You know, you're not providing cost information or anything like that, but you need to give some sort of shipment level detail so that your non-incumbent carriers can, can work on it. So, you know, and particularly uh, right now, if you're single sourced with UPS or with FedEx, build that relationship with your non-incumbent carrier. Um, you know, get to know the sales rep, have them come in, you know, let them talk about their, uh, their, their business and what they've got going on, uh, and even get some pricing in place. Uh, you know, if, if you've got that relationship and then if something comes up, you know, all of a sudden, as you know, Greg mentioned earlier, if you know, UPS is a little bit slower to a particular lane that's important to you, then you've got some pricing with FedEx or vice versa uh, that you can that you can use, uh, and you've, you've got that relationship. So if something goes wrong, you've got somebody that you can talk to because you know, it, it is, you know, it, it's a price game, of course, on one hand, but it's also a relationship game. You're much more likely to get get some success if you know it's if you've built a relationship with your with the non-incumbent, even if you know, even if you're not shipping with them, you know you're working with them and and giving them a chance to to understand your business, then you've got a, you've got a, a good chance for some success um, if you, when you need them. And uh, then the you know the alternative carriers. So you got to figure out which ones are right for you. You know, are you a lightweight residential shipper? Then you know look at the post office, look at postal consolidators. Oh, if you've got a large percentage of your customers that are close to you, then those regional carriers that we talked about, uh, depending on where you are in the country, you've got uh, laser ship and on track, which have merged and are working on putting together a you know, almost uh, potentially a third national option. Uh, if they're, they're, they'll be rolling in, they'll be launching their business in Texas uh, at the beginning of next year. So which kind of fills in, fills in a gap on the South. Uh, the other sort of big metro area that's that would, that's a blank for them right now is Illinois. It remains to be seen what happens, but you know, with with that merger, you've pretty much got you've got the East Coast, you've got the West Coast pretty well covered, uh, so you know, they could be an option uh, as well, uh, along with some of those smaller regional carriers, depending on where you are in the country. Um, or if you know, if transit time isn't important, some of the postal consolidators or postal options are a little bit slower. Or of course, you've got FedEx Ground Economy, you've got UPS SurePost. You know, it's, that's the, you know, that part of the business is going to be your least expensive option on the shipping side. You have to understand the impact on transit times. So uh, like, like we mentioned on the earlier slide, um, you know, if, you're, if you know your customers and you know that they understand, all right, if I'm paying for free shipping, it's gonna be that, you know, that post office option and it could take four, five, six, seven days and that's fine, then you know, by all means, that, you know, that could be, that's an option to, to look at. But you know, if your customers are expecting that Amazon type service, or you know, of course, if the product is perishable or whatever, then, you know, then the, the slower postal consolidators won't necessarily work. But you know, a lot of it is you know, just 
really getting into your data, both from a numerical perspective, and then also understanding your um, understanding your contracts as well to you know, see if they're penalty clauses and you know, know what happens if you move some volume away, how that could impact those portfolio tier discounts or earned discounts with, with UPS and FedEx. Um, and then, you know, there are new entrants in the marketplace you know, and, and starting to understand who those are and how they could fit is also uh, is, is another option on those alternative carrier sides. <clears throat> Oh, and uh, as as we're going through this and, and talking to shippers, um, you know, we're definitely getting more people from you know, prospects, clients, what have you, that are willing to look at that multi-carrier solution that are tired of being single sourced with, you know, with UPS or with FedEx or whomever and understanding that that need to diversify is uh, is really important. Uh, and then you know, Greg talked about this a little bit. Of course, the systems are better. So, you know, multiple integrations with all sorts of carriers, you know, the ones that we've talked about, the newer ones that are coming on, you know, a lot of their business is built around those integrations and you know, being able to, to work with a lot of different systems, which makes it easier to rate shop. Yeah, um, and I think to that point too, um, you know, with the WMSs and the TMSs, being single source, as you mentioned, a lot of the, the client had built out, you know, API connections to say FedEx specifically. Um, and, you know, now that becomes a limiting factor, right? Because if you want to roll on like a laser chip and on track, you know, you need to build that connection, right? And now I want to roll on LSO, I need to build that connection. So with the multi-carrier systems now, you make one connection to them from your WMS or your ERP, and that multi-carrier system will have all of those connections. So it really speeds up how fast and how flexible you can be to be able to change to the new carriers that you're going to want to leverage, um, as well as the cost to do it. So instead of having to tap IT resources to build this new interface now, you're just calling your vendor that, that has your multi-carrier system, your partner, and saying, hey, you know, we want to roll on LaserShip or, you know, we want to roll on Speedy. And then, you know, it's a couple of weeks and, you know, much, much cheaper price as well. Yeah. And then, you know, there is, of course, you know, this fear of the unknown and fear of losing your discounts with FedEx and UPS. So, you know, that's part of it. But, you know, it's important to you know, be transparent if, you know, as you're, you're talking to these carriers that you haven't really dealt with before and understand how it's going to work operationally. Make sure that there's, that there's comfort both on, you know, from you, know, you as the decision maker and then also the, uh, the people that ultimately are going to execute getting the shipments out the door, that they're going to understand how pickups are going to work, what's going to be different, what's going to be the same, you know, how the systems are going to talk to each other on the IT side. You know, all that, all that is there, but having those open communications uh, to, to help get past that fear is important. And then, you know, the, the math associated with losing discounts with FedEx and UPS. So yes, you know, if you move volume away, then it will affect your portfolio tier earned discount calculation. Uh, one thing to consider you know, it's a 52 week rolling average. So it takes time for any sort of change to uh, kind of flow through these calculations. So, you know, just because you move 20% of your volume over, you know, away from FedEx next week, doesn't mean that all of a sudden, doesn't mean that your earned discount calculation is going to drop by 20% the week after that. So, you know, there is a little bit of time there to, uh, to, to do it. And you can even work to restructure those agreements. Uh, you know, and then we talked about the penalty clauses and things like that um, as well. So just something to be aware of with respect to your agreement, you know, how that could, you know, if, if that's an impact. <clears throat> uh, and finally, so some of the benefits, you know, or a lot of them are pretty apparent as, as we've talked through it. You know, look, there's flexibility. Now, all of a sudden, you know, if UPS isn't providing the service that you want, you've got FedEx, you've got a regional carrier, you've got a postal consolidator, whoever. Or, you know, or vice versa, if FedEx isn't there, or you, know, or you want to split you know, by state or you know, by service or what have you, you've got that ability, you're not single sourced. Um, and there is of course opportunity for cost savings in all of this. A lot of times, you know, particularly if you're a residential shipper uh, with a lot of you know, zone two, zone three, zone four shipments, some of those regional carriers can provide both you know, the same or better transit times and a little bit better cost. Uh, and kind of goes along with this, uh, with this other bullet point as well. Uh, and then there's some accountability now. You know, if you've been with, you know, 
you've been with the same carrier for 15 years, then there's certainly some complacency there uh, and some unwillingness to, you know, maybe make some make some adjustments that there could be if they in a situation like this where you know that there's multi carriers involved, uh, that there's an opportunity to get more business. Uh, and you know, so it's going to make sure that each carrier, you know, everyone is on their toes and, and putting their best foot forward for uh, for you as a shipper uh, because they want to earn more business uh, and make sure that they're that they're taking care of you. And, you know, Greg, what else uh, do you want to add on to the, on this part? No, I was just going to say no. Those are good points, and you know, I, I think you know as far as potential for cost savings too you know, that that's a great point, not just with freight rates, uh, but also, you know, when you go to the warehouse and look at your your processes, right, that's, you want to look for savings there as well. Um, you know, and some of the, the things we talked about earlier can really save quite a bit of money, labor cost and, and labor, we didn't really touch on it too much, but I know that you're all struggling out there with labor. It's, it's hard to get people right now uh, to work in the warehouse. Uh, they're expensive. Um, so, you know, it's anything you can do to to shave labor is great because you, you don't have the headcount you used to have. And in addition, it's more expensive. And anything that you can do to, to make it easier for the temp workers to come on during peak, you know, so the procedures you have in place in the warehouse and, and everything, the step that you do to move that tribal knowledge from your shipping supervisors and people like that that have been doing this for years and they all have it in their head and get that into the system itself um, that's key, right? Because then, you know, they actually get to take time off. But not only that, when you bring in the temporary workers, they're able to, to get up to speed very quickly in training and start picking, packing, shipping, et cetera, very quickly as well. All right. Well, that kind of brings us to the end of what we wanted to go over. So you know, we've got you know, 10, 12 minutes left. So we'll certainly open up to any questions that have come across. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, everybody, while you have two industry experts here, captive audience for the next 10 minutes, maybe feel free to send us a chat, raise your hand, ask a question, and hopefully we can knock it out. Additionally, please follow Keith, follow Greg, follow Shipware, follow Creative Logistics on LinkedIn for additional industry updates. You know, Shipware is going to be immediately on any rate increases that will be released. Um, Keith mentioned that FedEx one to be expected next month. Um, we always compare that versus UPS, how that will impact you. And if you have any other questions, um, maybe Keith, you can go back to the title slide, send an email to Greg, send an email to Keith. Um, you can reach out to us um, by going to shipware.com to our website. So we have a chat bubble in there. You can just say you, you were at the multi-carrier webinar and um, we can make sure you talk to either Greg, Keith, or myself about any additional questions you may have. Um, but I think the overarching theme is that people are more and more open to a multi-carrier supply chain and it's possible and it's not as unreachable or untainable as you may think it is. I think the barrier to entry was always the hardest part when consulting with our clients. They know that they know that it's a possibility um, and you know, we're happy to help um, if, if that's the case. We've got a question here, guys, from Clark. Another one, too. I'm going to start with Clark. Um, what's the biggest, single biggest challenge you see with the carriers over the next two years? Uh, maybe, Keith, you can talk about that, being from the carrier side of the house, and Greg also on the technology side. Yeah, I, uh, at least from my perspective, um, you know, I, I think the labor challenge is, is going to be there. Um, you know, FedEx, we talked a little bit about it. It's all contractor-based. So, you know, there's, and there, we're already seeing some, some issues on that side. And then UPS, it's union. And, you know, that, uh, that union agreement is, is coming up, I believe, next year. Uh, and, you know, they've got a new union head. And, um, you know, so those, those conversations will be tricky as well. So uh, from, that's kind of the, the immediate thing that came to my mind around the biggest challenge over the next couple of years. Greg? Yeah. And, and from a system standpoint, um, you know, I think the biggest challenge is really the, the nationals from a system standpoint will be fine. It's the regionals that are really 
kind of having to step up their game a bit, so to speak. Um, you know, they, I, I obviously COVID caught everybody by surprise and, and the regionals went from, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was roughly pre COVID they were handling like right around 10% of the total shipping volume, parcel volume in the U S and post COVID they were up around 30%. So their volumes increased substantially. And from a technology standpoint, a lot of them weren't really ready for that. Uh, so we've already seen some some huge advancements there, <clears throat> but I think that's for the regionals, the biggest challenge is going to be getting their technology up to the point where systems like uh, InfoShip, our, our multi-carrier system, will be able to connect with them quickly and easily, and then we'll add them to our library and they'll be able to leverage our clients. Yeah, and on, on the topic of regionals, Greg, and, and the systems, the next question was around any other regional carriers that should be considered besides the ones we talked about on track and laser ship GLS. And I'd say initially that it's totally dependent on where your customers are. So, you know, we need to understand your data. So we can't really answer that one. Um, there's, you know, LSO services, Texas and the adjacent States. Um, but there's a ton of options out there that are doing a great job. And there's also um, other crowdsourcing final mile carriers that are really shaking up the industry in specific um, cities, municipalities, specifically the majors, New York, Los yeah, Angeles, day, Texas. A lot of same day shipping. Mm -hmm. well. So whoever that anonymous attendee was, I'd say, you know, there are others. Um, we just need to know and understand where the volume lies. And then we had another question roll in that said, when should you start onboarding carriers if it's too late for 2022, what can I do? Um, so great yeah, question. It's a, lot, <laughs> a lot of moving pieces on that one. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I'll let Keith speak to the relationship with the carrier and then I'll talk about the technology. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, is it, is it too late for 2022? Not yet for most carriers. Now I will say um, for laser ship slash on track, uh, they did, they did put a halt on 2022 business uh, two weeks ago, like the beginning of uh, beginning of August. But um, you know, I've I've talked to you know I was talking to DHL Commerce the other day. They have not yet put in a, a hold for onboarding new business. FedEx, UPS, uh, similar. They're usually pretty pretty flexible. Now, some of it may be location specific. It could be one of those, you know, if you're in this, um, you know, if you're in this location, you know, maybe there's less flexibility or, or whatnot, but um, you know, it's, it's not too late, but it's getting close for 2022. Some carriers it might be, but as a, as a blanket, there is, there is still opportunity, but the, the sooner you can get those conversations started, the better as far as the kind of getting pricing in place and then Greg on the tech side. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. That's, that's very true, Keith. And also, you know, my suggestion for the tech side is to reach out to your, your partner that provides your system. And even if you're just thinking, oh, we're thinking maybe we're going to do this or this or this work with them, right? It's, it's definitely has to be a partnership. So tell them, hey, we're thinking about bringing on maybe these regionals. What do you think? And number one, we, they can tell you technology wise, like, oh, yeah, we have an interface to all of them. We can roll them on in, you know, 10 days, no problem. Um, but at another level is, you know, ask them, what do you think about them? Like, do other customers use them? You know, how, you know, have you had experience with them? Because, you know, we're the, the ones that see them all the time and our clients tell us like, oh, you know, these guys were great. They would, they bent over backwards or wow, these guys really couldn't handle our volume. Um, so, so that is my suggestion is when you're thinking about it, loop in uh, your partner early so that you can get some good feedback and, and, and you know, which way to go. Another question. Thanks, Greg, Keith. Um, around the threat of Amazon becoming a competitive carrier to the big two. And, you know, there's, I know they're doing some test markets and have gone after some specific UPS or FedEx customers. Um, we can't really say anything more concrete than that, other than I do anticipate that to happen. It's just a matter of time. I don't have any idea on timeline, though. Um, Keith, Greg, anything to add to that one? Yeah, I, I I agree. I think it. I I think they are going to. Amazon is going to do something in in the short term uh, around being a being some sort of option as a as a shipper. So it'll it will it will be curious because yes, they they have been looming for years. Yeah. So at some point they are going to come out of the shadows. They definitely have the infrastructure. I think it's you know, and at first I think they're going to cherry pick customers, right? That 
that they want, and then we'll see what happens uh, with those. Yeah, and, and on the cherry picking side, we have had customers of ours at Shipware mention that you know, they've been approached by an Amazon sales rep. So they are out there, they are reaching out to certain customers offering a service, but it's specific to you know, those hot zones where they have the infrastructure in place already. Um, so yeah, it's probably just a matter of time. Yeah. Anything else, guys? We're wrapping up here on time. Thanks for everyone for sticking around. I know we're, people are trickling out now. But once again, just any additional questions, feel free to send us an email, connect with us on LinkedIn, follow Shipware, follow Creative Logistics. There's always articles. We're constantly quoted in different um, periodicals, online um, you know, magazines around supply chain logistics, the market. And so, yeah, if you have any questions about your specific data, your specific solutions, technology, we're happy to talk about that too. The cool thing about both shipware and creative logistics is um, it's, it's consultative first, right? We, we don't have anything we can, we can sell anyone. It's always based on our customers or, or clients needs. So um, we're happy to take a look and run an analysis and see if there is opportunity to make any new really carrier switches or, or technology, um, you know, shifts. So. Yeah, I see we got, we have a question around sustainability. So how does that factor in the, into the strategy and hearing from customers that it's their customers want it to be part of their supply chain focus? Um, yeah, it's a, that's an interesting question. And it's not one that I've had come up very often from, from prospects and clients that, that I've dealt with on the sustainability side. So, um, you know, I, I think it is something that, that needs to be considered. I'm not sure that, FedEx or UPS, you know, you'll uh, short other than, you know, the occasional articles about how oh, they've agreed to, you know, buy 50 electric vans or, or what have you. Um, I'm not sure it's as much of a focus as maybe it should be. Yeah, I would think, you know, we used to work with customers and they would limit the amount of shipments. If an order was three units, they put it all in one box instead of it being shipped out in three separate boxes. Um, there's ways you can implement rules like that if something's out of stock. So you're not shipping out three packages that could fit into one. But yeah, you're right, Keith. There's not as much emphasis on this on really tangible, sustainable strategies. Um, but I think it's just a matter of time once the whole market moves electric and you know, obviously the boxes and the paper and the recycling. I mean, there's so many different ways you can maybe get the eco stamp um, but it may be, that's an opportunity though, for anyone out there just wanting to start a business, a <laughs> sustainable shipper, sustainable carrier. I don't know how you get it done though. You have to get a horse again, <laughs> the original post office. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like they still deliver with those. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All righty. Well, if you don't have any other questions, let everyone get back to it. They're Wednesday. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Keith. And um, hopefully you guys took something away from this. I know I did. So appreciate it, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.